Thank you. I imagine that um, most of you are, are here today um, for, for much of the same reason. I think the reaction that many people had when I was named chancellor was just sheer curiosity of what on God's green earth was Adrian Fenty thinking, hiring this 37-year-old Korean girl from Toledo, Ohio, who's never run a school, much less a school district. Um, and why does he think that she is going to be able to solve the problems of the lowest performing school district in the country? Um, so that was the widespread thought when, um, when, when Fenty first uh, announced me as his pick. And remember that this is a man, uh, he, he swept into office in November of 2006, the youngest mayor that D.C. ever saw at 37 years old, and the first uh, candidate ever to win every single precinct in the district. And um, the interesting thing was that he, uh, you know, was not the favorite. Nobody thought that Adrian Fenty stood a chance. Um, he never showed up to any of the debates. Um, the polls were not good on him. Uh, there were a whole lot of other politicians who had a lot more credibility uh, and name recognition. Um, and Adrian Fenty, uh, his, his philosophy was that he wasn't going to play um, the game by the regular rules. He thought that the way that he was going to win the election was to go door to door. Um, so legend says that he knocked on nearly half of the doors in the city. Um, and that the outcome was that, um, that he won uh, not, every, uh, not only every precinct, but about 89, I think, percent of the vote. So he came in with a very clear mandate from the people. Um, and on his second day in office, so he waited a really long time before he did it, second day in office, he introduced legislation um, to take mayoral control of the schools. And uh, that, I think, was the very beginning uh, of, of our journey. Um, he approached me in May 2007 uh, about taking this job, uh, appointed me on the first day that the district came under his control. And the, it, you should know that the personnel legislation, or the, the legislation around the school governance specifically outlined this very comprehensive process that was going to take place in order to choose the new chancellor. And instead of following that process, well, he thinks he followed the process, but um, what happened was he took control and then he announced me and there's sort of shock waves throughout the city. So here I am, I walk into the school district and people were saying to me, oh my gosh, where are you going to start? I was thinking the exact same thing in my head, like where am I going to start? And what a lot of, I thought, uh, incredibly uh, well-meaning and knowledgeable people said was the first thing that you have to do, Michelle, is you have to figure out where the money is going. So the reality in Washington, D.C. is that we spend almost more per child than almost any other urban jurisdiction in the country, but our results are at the absolute bottom. And so, you know, people often argue about whether the, the, what, what needs to happen in public education is we need more money or not. And so, you know, here's, here's this place, Washington, D.C., which is a proof point to money doesn't matter, right? Because you're spending all this money and you're not producing the results. So what I did was I had my people go out and I said, figure out where all the money is going. Because if you walked into our schools, any school in Washington, DC, you didn't feel like we were one of the richest districts in the country, certainly. Um, so very early on in my tenure, one of my, um, one of my assistants came to me and he said, you, you are you're not going to believe this. He said, we spend about $80 million a year transporting a few thousand special education kids through the system. So I'm doing the quick back of the envelope math and it turned out it was about $18,000 per child per year just on transportation. And I thought, okay, I don't know anything about running bus routes, but I know I can do it for cheaper than $18,000 a year because for $18,000 a year, you can buy the kid a Saturn their first year, and a driver for the Saturn every year after that for $18,000 a year. So I thought, this is super. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run better bus routes. We're going to push the money down to the classroom. My special assistant said, no, you know what? It turns out that the district had done such a poor job in the past of transporting special education kids that um, now we were under a court order, a consent decree. And there's a court-appointed special master who runs the bus system, and he's allowed to spend as much money as he wants to, 
as long as he gets the kids to school on time, and all we can do is pay the bill. We have no ability to control costs. I thought that was the craziest thing I had ever heard. Until the next day, when <laughs> another staff member of mine came to me and said, did you know that we as the district, we are responsible for paying the private school tuition of special education kids who don't get the services that they need from the district? I had never heard that before, so I said, okay, so tell me more about it. And he said, you know, a lot of these private schools are incredibly costly. He said, I started looking into it. He said, I'm, I'm just going to give you one example of what happened. He said, I found this one staff member that we have central office staff member, who on one kid, she didn't fill out a form she was supposed to fill out. And on another student, she didn't have a meeting she was supposed to have. And in both cases, because she didn't do the, take these actions, it resulted in both of these children getting sent to a private facility that cost the district $227,000 a year per child in tuition. I, now, now I've heard it all, right? So I said, okay, I'm going to have to meet this woman. So my, um, my assistant calls her and says, ma'am, we would like you to come to a meeting at the chancellor's office at 5 o'clock. She said, well, I'm going to have to check with my supervisor on that. My assistant said, ma'am, the chancellor is your supervisor. <laughs> She's everybody's supervisor. She said, well, that's fine. I'm going to bring my lawyer if you make me come. He said, bring whoever you need to come, bring. Just show up at 5 o'clock. So he tells me this whole story. I walk in. At first I sit down. I say, so I understand you have a question about who you report to. And she said, no, 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 that was a mistake. I was just nervous. I didn't mean that. And I said, okay. So then I pull out the files. I said, this kid, you, the meeting, this kid, the form. I said, with two mistakes, you've cost this district nearly half a million dollars. Help me understand what happened. And she looked at me and she said, well, you need to understand that I am a very busy person. I have too many children in my caseload and not enough time in the day, so things are going to th fall through the cracks. That's just the way it is. And I looked at her and I said, no, you need to understand that if you believe this job is too big for you, then you need to go find another job. But if you are going to take the paycheck home every, every other week, then you have to take personal responsibility for doing everything within your job purview and doing it well. And she looked at me and she said, but that's not fair. <laughs> and literally, I had experience after experience like this in my first few weeks where I was running into people who were working with no realization at all about the fact that they were going to be held accountable for doing their job well. So, I started doing what I think lots of CEOs in turnaround situations do. I started firing people. That was my first mistake. <laughs> so about five weeks in, my, my general counsel, my then general counsel, runs into my office. <laughs> and I have an open door policy. People can come into my office. So he closes the door so I knew I was in trouble. And he said, Chancellor, you have got to stop firing people. And I said, why? If people aren't doing their jobs, we need to move them out. We need to get people in who can do you know, the job better. And he said, welcome to the DC public schools, where we never fire anyone. And I said, come on now. I, I know you're exaggerating. I've talked to a lot of people uh, in this city, and they tell me that it actually is possible to remove incompetent employees. There's just a process. Just, I don't want to break any rules. Just tell me what the process is, and we'll follow the process. He said, well, there are only two ways that you can fire an employee in the school system. I said, okay, give me the first way. And he said, you have to have done something egregious. And I said, well, that's perfect, because everyone I'm talking about is egregiously incompetent. And he said, no, 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 that doesn't count. And he's like, only two things really count as egregious. One, you have to have hit a kid, and we have to have a videotape to show it, because the principal and three teachers seeing is not enough. Or you have to have stolen money from the district, and we have to have the bank receipt to show it. Short of that, Nothing counts as egregious. I said, okay, that's not good news. Give me the second way I can fire somebody. He said, can you please stop saying that? We don't say fired. I said, what do we say? He said, separate them from the system. <laughs> I said, okay, what's the second way we can separate somebody from the system? And he said, you have to show a recurring pattern of ineffectiveness. I said, well, that shouldn't be so hard. I'm sure that these people did not magically become incompetent the moment that I walked in the door, right? So we ought to be able to show that there is a pattern. 
He said, well, that's what you would think, but what you don't know is that for seven years, no one in the central office has received a performance evaluation. And to meet the legal letter of the law to show a recurring pattern, you have to have documentation in their performance evaluation, but since we haven't done any performance evaluations, you don't have that documentation, so you can't do that either. I said, so that's really, really bad news. So tell me, what am I supposed to do with these people then who I don't feel are doing a very good job for kids in the central office? And he said, well, you can do what we normally do. I said, what's that? He said, we send them down to the schools. I said, are you kidding me? I'm trying to get these people away from children, not put them closer to kids. So what I did was I actually decided for the short term to put a, a lot of these people on administrative leave because think about it for a second. I paid that lady that I just talked about, I paid her $40,000 a year. She comes into work, makes two mistakes, costs me half a million dollars. I'm better off actually keeping her at home for a little while and saving money <laughs> than I am having her come to work every day. So I went to the mayor and I said, um, sir, you brought me in to do an incredibly difficult job, but the difficult job becomes the impossible job if I can't build my own team, if I can't hold people accountable, you know, sort of run this, this school system as we would a, of any high functioning organization. And I explained the, the situation. He said, well, you know what? If you don't like the rules of the game, you change the rules. And so what we did was we introduced legislation to the city council that would allow us to make all central office employees at will employees. That was firestorm number one in the city. People went nuts. And probably, I've been at this job um, now for a little more than two years, and probably the most interesting day of my entire tenure here was the day of the city council hearing about this legislation. It was 14 hours long, people parading in and out all day long, pounding on the dais, yelling, this lady is evil, she doesn't care about people, you know, what about job security, what about training, what about professional development, what about due process? And I just kept sitting there thinking the entire time, you know what, the children in this city don't have any due process. If you don't get the education you deserve as a kid in this city, you can't go to an appeals board and say, I didn't get my education, please refund my parents' taxpayer dollars back. No, what we do in our city is we move you on to the next grade without the skills and knowledge that you need to be successful in life, and then you know, every, all the adults get to keep their jobs and everything keeps moving, but the kids don't learn anything. So I was thinking, you know, kids don't have due process in this. And, and uh, you know, through all this, somebody asked me, um, actually one of the council members said to me, they said, um, don't you believe, Ms. Ree, that an incompetent teacher, for example, can become better through professional development? And I said, perhaps, but let us not let children languish in their care in the meantime. And let me explain why. I actually believe in professional development. We have increased the amount of professional de development dollars that we spend on teachers about 400% since I've been in office. So we are investing in our people. That said, I am a parent of two children who are in the DC public schools. And I can tell you that if I showed up for school on day one and my kid's principal said, welcome to school, here's Olivia's teacher. Guess what? She's not so good. But we're gonna spend this year professionally developing her to see if she can get better. <laughs> Olivia and her 23 friends here may not learn how to read, but we think that's the right thing to do for this adult. I would never accept that for my child. No one in this room would ever accept that as a reality for their child. But we have scores of children in our city who do not have the adult advocates in their lives, who know how to navigate through the system and get the good teachers in this classroom and that class. So the children literally are languishing in the classrooms of ineffective teachers. And let me tell you this, the research says that particularly for poor and minority kids, if you have three effect, highly effective teachers in a row versus three ineffective teachers in a row, it can literally change your life trajectory. So say I, would, I, I decided, you know what, that's the right thing to do for that adult, we'll let Olivia and her little friends stay in that classroom. What if that class of kids the next year were unlucky enough to get another ineffective teacher? Would, be, would we be willing to trade two-thirds of those kids' chance in life so that we could professionally develop two adults? 
those are, those, are the, those are the struggles and the balances that we constantly have to be thinking about as we're making the, these tough decisions. So the, this whole notion around accountability or the lack thereof is one of the primary things, in my opinion, that is leading to the low outcomes in urban public schools across the country. The second one is the fact that if you look at how school districts operate, um, a lot of policies and decisions are made based on politics, based on what adults want to do and what adults think. Not, not, it's not about the kids. Let me give you one example. Uh, I decided in my first year that we needed to close a lot of schools. So the reality in Washington, D.C. is was at its height, it had about 140,000 students. It had been rapidly decreasing over a two-decade time period. When I inherited the district, there were 50,000 kids in the school district, but we had never right-sized the district. So we had way too many schools operating for far too many students. And that was part of the reason why people didn't feel like we were spending a lot of money, because we were paying a lot of money to light, heat, and air condition half-empty buildings. So I said we were going to close schools. And what I quickly learned is that if you want to very rapidly become the most unpopular person in a city, all you need to do is announce that you're closing a school, much less 23, which is how my, I decided to close. 23 schools in one year. It was about 15% of the inventory. And that was firestorm number two of my tenure. Uh, people don't like when you close down schools. So we're, you know, arguing about this and then I'm getting, I'm going to these community events and people are screaming, yelling, they're throwing things at me. And I remember going to one city council hearing, I mean, excuse me, meeting where one of the council members stood up and said, look, Michelle, everybody knows that we have to close schools. This is a reality that this city has faced for a long time. We just haven't done it. Everybody knows it needs to happen. And you can close any school in the city that you want to as long as it's not in my ward. And I said, well, that's great. If all eight of the ward council members feel the same way, then we're not going to be able to close any schools. But what I realized was that in the past, that's how the decisions got made, was everyone was protecting their area, and it was all a political game instead of getting above that to say, what is the right thing for the system? What is the right thing for the children? and then making the decisions that way. And you cannot operate in an environment where your job is to produce results for kids and what's driving you is actually the politics amongst adults. So in my opinion, all of this um, in DC led to some of the lowest uh, outcome levels that you can possibly imagine. Lots of people widely know DC public schools as the lowest performing and most dysfunctional school district in the country. Um, but let me give you some data around that. Um, first, we are the only school district in the country that is on high risk status with the US Department of Education, mostly for the misuse of federal funds. Second, we have an achievement gap between our white kids and our black kids of 70 percentage points. Seven zero, 70 percentage points was the achievement gap that existed when we came into office at the secondary level. Of all of the ninth graders who began high school with us, only 9% of them graduated from college within five years. And of all of the eighth graders uh, who took the 2007 NAEP examination, only 8% of them were on grade level in mathematics. 8% which means that 92% of our young people did not have the skills and knowledge necessary to be productive members of society. And probably the most disheartening data point was about our little ones, and basically what that data said was that our kids, when they came into our system as kindergartners, were actually relatively on par with kindergartners from other urban jurisdictions, not with their suburban counterparts. We already knew they were far behind them, but with other kids who looked like them from cities like Philadelphia and LA and Oakland across the country. The problem is that the longer they stayed in our system, the worse off they were. By the time they were in the third grade, they were far behind their counterparts. And this is an interesting statistic. The poor black fourth graders in New York City are operating two full grade levels ahead of the poor black fourth graders in Washington, D.C. So for everyone who wants to blame the low academic achievement levels of poor minority kids on poverty and on single parent households and on the violence in the community, all those sorts of things, the last time I looked, the poverty in Harlem 
does not look all that different from the poverty in southeast Washington, D.C., but those children are operating two grade levels ahead of ours. Essentially, that means that our kids were trapped in a system where they were almost better off staying at home every day than they were coming to school because they were falling so far behind every year that they were in our system. So what I found through my first year of being on this job, I would go out and talk to forums like this all across the city. And I would talk about what we were trying to do and how we were going to get there. And oftentimes people would come up to me afterwards and say, you know, Michelle, we like you. You are enthusiastic. You work hard. You have a lot of energy. But we don't think you're going to be able to do this job. And I always say, gee, thanks. Why? <laughs> and they, they would say, because, because the, what you're describing is just a reality of the society that we live in. Because of the social and economic inequalities that we have in this society, you're always going to have a dynamic where there are you know, wealthy neighborhoods, and in those neighborhoods, you're going to have good schools, and then you're going to have poor neighborhoods, and in those neighborhoods, you're going to have not so good schools. As long as you have that economic disparity, you're always going to have that dynamic, which I thought was interesting. And, uh, and I was telling the, the students uh, earlier that one, uh, one day, a, a little over a year ago, I, I had the good fortune of having dinner with Warren Buffett. Now, I'd never thought in my entire life I'd be sitting down to eat with Warren Buffett, but he's a DCPS graduate and alum. And um, so I went to Omaha, and I sat down at dinner with him, and he said, you know, Michelle, Fixing the problems in public education today is very easy. And I was like, really? Can you fill me in so I can run back home and fix the schools in DC? He's like, all you have to do is make private schools illegal and assign every child to a public school by random lottery. So think about this for a minute. If we did that in DC, and every CEO's child, every ambassador's child, every congressman's child, and the president's children all had to go to a random DCPS school by lottery, which means that a majority of them would be going over to Anacostia every day, since that's where most of our schools are. I guarantee you that you would never see a faster movement of resources from one side of the city to the other as you would in that circumstance. And I also guarantee you that in very short order, we would have a system of excellent schools. So the question in my mind is not, is it possible to do this? That's not the question. The question is, do we as the adults in this city and across the country have the wherewithal that it would take to make the incredibly difficult decisions that are necessary to make that a reality for every single child growing up in this nation? And the answer to that question, at least so far, is an easy no. We've not been willing to make those decisions. But I do think there is a tremendous amount of hope. Uh, we have a, an incredibly unique president um, who has taken very uh, hard stands on what he believes are the right educational reforms to make. We have a great new education secretary. But I, I will tell you this, you know, people say, well, how are you going to solve these problems? Why do you think it's possible? I think there are two reasons that sort of drive my thinking around why I think it's possible to radically change the learning outcomes for the kids in cities like Washington, D.C., and they are leadership and human capital quality. So I'm going to talk about the first one. Um, you know, people all the time come to me and they say, oh, you're great. How do we get more people like you to become urban superintendents? And what I always say to people is, I'm, People like me are a dime a dozen. You can find a Teach for America alumni anywhere. You can stick them in my job, and they would want to do the exact same things that I'm doing. The only reason why we have been able to see the progress over the last two years that we have is because of the mayor and his relentless pursuit of excellence in the schools. So when he, when he first approached me about this job, um, I told his people that that was the last thing I wanted to do. I was like, are you crazy? Who wants to be an urban superintendent? That's the worst job in the world. Um, and you know, I, it was only after I talked to Fenty a couple of times that, that I began to, ch to change my mind. Um, but I knew I had made the right decision when, um, on my, uh, uh, during my first cabinet meeting, 
He introduced me to the other agency heads. He said, this is Michelle Ree. I've chosen her to come in and run the schools. And I want everyone to know right now that no one is allowed to say no to Michelle Ree except for me. So that's not a bad little introduction, right? <laughs> So a few weeks go by and a couple people were trying to open schools and, you know, get schools ready and a couple people had said no to me and he brings everybody together again. He said, let me be perfectly clear one more time. He said, if I hear that any of you or any of the people that work for you are standing in the way of the progress in schools, you will be fired immediately. And he set the stage immediately as to how he was gonna make education the number one priority in the city, and he has never veered from that through things that make most politicians crazy, right? School closings, firing people, sorry, separating people from the district, <laughs> all those things are the things that make most politicians like really sort of cringe because that's what makes your phones ring off the hook and then you think, oh, I'm not going to be able to get reelected and all this sort of thing. Those things do not phase Adrian Fenty. He has the firm belief that in order to make the city a great city, you have to have a great public school system. So that's his singular focus. And I want to just give you one example to show you how different this man is. When we were heading into the fiscal year 10 budgeting process, he made the announcement very early on that he was going to hold the schools harmless. He wasn't going to touch the school's budget. Now, the city was facing an $800 million deficit. So to make that kind of a statement was not a quick or easy thing. And, and he got a lot of flack for it from people, other agency heads, other politicians who were saying, are you crazy? The school district is the largest employer that we have in the city government. They have to shoulder their fair share of the burden. And the mayor said, no, they don't. And let me tell you why. He said, we are in the fiscal crisis that we are in this state and in this country because of the irresponsibility of adults. We are not going to make up for this on the backs of children. He said, when I say education is my number one priority, I don't just say that because it sounds good. Having a priority means that in circumstances like this, you're willing to cut everything else a little deeper so that you can protect your priority. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So this is, I mean, I don't think there was another politician anywhere in the country that was willing to take that hard a stand on the financing of education, particularly because only 20% of the voting population in DC actually have school-age kids. And who really, you know, this is a driver of, 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 of the decisions that they're making politically. But he has made this decision and has stuck firm toward to it. And, and I think that everyone in the city very clearly knows that he is not going to waver from his commitment to schools. And that's the kind of leadership that has allowed us to move in the way that we have. Um, we, we don't have an elected school board uh, anymore in the district. Uh, I am managed directly by the mayor. And so while my colleagues across the country uh, who work in a school board structure tell me that they spend between 65 and 70 percent of their time just managing the school board and, you know, understanding, how, counting votes and trying to figure out how we're going to get this policy through or that policy through, I always tell people when we want a new policy to be introduced, I go to the mayor and I say, guess what we're going to do? I got a new idea. And he listens to me and he says, great, let's go. Think about how efficient that is. So leadership is, is the one way. The second thing, and, and um, if you know anything about me, you, you probably heard a little bit about this, is that I believe that the most important lever that you can pull in this entire school reform movement, the, the, the factor that has the single greatest impact on student achievement levels is the quality of the educators that we have in our school system. Lots of people disagree with me. Lots of people say, you know what, well, you, you can't expect to be able to educate kids at the highest levels if they're coming from home environments where they're not being fed properly, where they don't get you know, proper health care and you know, those sorts of things. And, and let me be clear in saying that those are real challenges that our kids face every day. You cannot ignore them. You cannot act like they don't exist. Uh, and so they are real and they're tough. But we believe that it is absolutely possible to overcome those challenges with the right person in front of educators. And I'm gonna share with you one story about how I know this. So 
uh, early on in my tenure, I went to a school which was a typical DCPS school. Um, it was in a not so great part of town where uh, it's very well known how much violence there is. As I was walking up to the school, I noticed there was a, across the street from the school, there's a liquor store and there's a nightclub. And you walk up into the school and there's blunts everywhere and broken beer bottles and that sort of thing. You walked into the school and, you know, the school is physically in utter disrepair as well. And I walked into uh, a random classroom, and when I go, I, I do all of my school visits unannounced, so I don't tell anyone I'm coming, and I'd never stop by the front office. Um, I go incognito. Uh, so I walk into the first school, uh, or a classroom, and um, I, what I saw was absolutely uh, fantastic. I saw this teacher, and she's energetic, and she's bounding around the room, and she's teaching this lesson. I could tell by just looking around and listening to the conversation that the kids were doing a unit on Greek mythology. And so they're reading a book together, and they're reading, they're getting to the point of the book where I'm sort of picking up from context clues that this group of kids have traveled back in time, back to the time of Greek gods, and they're at the part of the story where they're trying to get back, you know, travel back to the future. So the teacher says, please look at the posters up around the wall of all of the Greek gods and tell me if you were this group of kids and you need to travel back in time, which god would you call on for help? So I'm looking around the room. I have my little answer. First kid raises his hand. He said, I would choose Zeus because Zeus is the god of gods. He's the boss of all the other gods. If he tells you to do something, you have to do it. So I figure, just cut out the middle man and go straight to Zeus. It's like, that is a good answer. Second child raises her hand. She said, I would choose this God. It was the God of women, children, and families. She said, these are kids who are traveling back in time. She, you know, she has to take care of her peeps. So if I was these kids, I would choose her because she's going to take care of them. It's like, that's another good answer. Third kid raises his hand, he said, he, I would choose this God. It was the God of art, music, and literature. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, kid, that was a total misfire. <laughs> and then he goes on to explain, he's like, as you'll remember from the story, uh, the kids had dug up an old Greek lyre, and they strummed the lyre, and that's how they got transported back in time. He said, so I figure if they got to go back, it has something to do with the lyre, they got to call on the God of music. I was like, huh. These kids gave five great answers before someone came up with my ever lame answer of the God of travel. <laughs> and it was exactly the kind of classroom that you would want to see. I mean, you know, no necessarily right or wrong answers, a whole lot of critical thinking and analysis going on, 100% of the kids engaged in the lesson. It was beautiful. I walk out of that classroom, I walk into a classroom across the hallway, and it's a the completely different situation. So I walk in the classroom, and this lady is standing at the door at the light switch, yelling, everybody, be quiet. <laughs> and she's like, I told you to be quiet. You are not listening to me. I'm going to give you 10 seconds. 10, 9, and she's flicking the light switch on and on. 8, 7, I'm waiting. I'm waiting, and you can see the kids, and they're like, we're waiting, too, for something to happen. <coughs> I was literally in both of these classrooms for only between 10 and 15 minutes each, and I could already tell you that these two groups of children who were in the same crappy school building with rainwater leaking through the roof and ceiling tiles falling down from the sky, getting two wildly different educational experiences because of the adults who were in front of them every single day. So if you don't believe that the, that the teachers can make a difference, then you are in direct opposition to what the children believe, because the children can tell you definitively that that is the case. So let me end on this note, because I know that people want to ask questions. I believe that public education is supposed to be the great equalizer in our country. It is supposed to be the thing that ensures that it does not matter if you are black or white, rich or poor. We have public schools so that every child can have an equal shot in life, right? If you work hard and you do the right thing, you can live the American dream. That is not the reality that most poor and minority children have in this country today. The reality, at least in Washington, D.C. today, is if you grow up in Georgetown, 
versus if you grow up in Anacostia, you get two wildly different educational experiences. Essentially what that means is that we are still in this day and age, in this day and age, we are still allowing the color of a child's skin and the zip code that they live in to dictate their educational attainment levels and therefore their life chances and their life outcomes. It is the biggest social injustice imaginable and it is something that we have to change within this generation. We have, and every adult in this room plays a role in this. We have to figure out, in this time of people talking about bailout packages and stimulus and this sort of thing, those are all short-term solutions. We are never gonna st solve the long-term problems in this country and regain our status as, as the global sort of uh, powerhouse until we solve the problems of public education in America. And until we live up to our promise, to every single young person who is born and grows up in this country, every single one of them should believe and have the reality that if they go to school and do the right thing, that they can receive an excellent education and an excellent school. That is our obligation as the adults in this society. Thank you. Raise your hand, we'll uh, get a microphone to you. Um, we'll start right here. I'm with the Public Education Foundation of Little Rock. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. But uh, I have 10 questions, I get to ask one. I would like for you to speak to what you look for in a principal, and also when you talk about evaluation, how you relate that to a new teacher, and uh, how you evaluate principals. Okay. So I think that was three questions. I'll try, to, I'll, I'll try to get that as much as I can. Um, what we look for in a principal, first and foremost, uh, we believe that principals have to be good managers of people, of adults, um, and that they have to be strong instructional leaders. And what we found in D.C., when I, when I um, took over the school district, what I found was a group of people uh, in the principal position who were largely uh, conflict averse. They didn't want any controversy. So they would rate adults in their building as being satisfactory, even though they knew they weren't satisfactory because they didn't want anyone to yell at them. Uh, we had a situation, I remember, and when I say instructional leader, there's a reason why. We, um, uh, I hold one-on-one -on -one meetings with all principals at the beginning of every school year so that we can set goals for that year. And when I started this, um, you know, I sat down with one principal and I said to him, I was asking him a lot of questions about it at the school, we set the goals for the year, I was asking him a number of questions, I, and one of the questions I asked him was, I said, how many ineffective teachers do you think you have in the school? And he said, none. And I said, but only 25% of your children are proficient. How can you have 100% effective teachers? Certainly, you can't you know, be blaming the low academic achievement levels on children. And so he was sort of hemming and hawing, and uh, his instructional superintendent was in the room, and she said, well, what about that one person, the fifth grade teacher on the third floor? Every time I go in there, there's chaos in the room. And he said to me, uh, no, no. She can teach a good lesson when she wants to. And I said, that is not the definition of an effective teacher. An effective teacher is not someone who can put on the dog and pony show once a year for their observation when they want to. An effective teacher is someone who day in and day out is utilizing effective instructional strategies that you have the data to show that they're mo you know, moving student achievement levels forward. And we were arguing back and forth for a while and finally I said stop. So let me ask you a question. Would you put your granddaughter in that person's classroom? And he said to me, well, if that's the standard, then I don't have any effective teachers in my school. And I said, that is the standard. That is the standard. Why would we have any different standard for the 344 children who count on you every day to make sure they're getting a quality education than we do for your granddaughter? We cannot hold these different expectations. And it was interesting because when I said I came in, uh, that eight percent of our kids were proficient, eighth graders were proficient in math on the NAEP. If you were to look at the 
performance evaluations of all of the adults in the system at the same time, everyone was exceeding expectations. How can you have that kind of a disconnect when every, all the adults think they're doing an excellent job and we're producing outcomes as poor as that? There has to be more of a connection. And so as we think about both evaluating teachers and principals, part of what we have to be looking at is how are the students progressing academically in your classroom and in your school. And I know that with some groups of people this is a very unpopular notion, but the bottom line for me is that our job as educators is to ensure that children are learning. Not that kids are happy and this and that, but that kids are learning. That is our primary responsibility. And so if part of the way that we are evaluating the job that we're doing isn't tied to looking at objective measures of student growth, then there is a problem with the evaluation system. Bill, if you go behind you. What role do you believe teachers unions have in transforming public schools? Well, I'm not sure I'm the best person to ask this question to. I will say that for people who, who want to blame teachers' unions for all of the ills of public education and who think that if we could just get rid of unions then we wouldn't have all these, that's actually incorrect. And the thing that, that, that makes me the maddest is the fact that people point oftentimes to collective bargaining agreements, which are problematic uh, documents, and they say, well, well here, here lies the problem. But remember that the unions don't unilaterally hand over a contract to a district. They, those contracts have to be signed off on by superintendents and by school boards. So for everything that's wrong with a collective bargaining agreement, we have to take the responsibility that from our side we've signed off on those documents. I believe that um, the teachers' unions, the biggest challenge that they face is, is shifting an entire sort of mindset mentality that exists right now along two fronts. One, um, in the past, I think the mentality has been very much that teachers are interchangeable parts, like widgets. You take one out, you put another one in, this one has more seniority, they're going to do a better job. That's just sort of was the, the expectation and understanding. And anybody who spends any time in schools knows that that's absolutely not true. That there are huge differences in teacher quality from one person to another, and you have to be able to take that into account. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is, if you look at what it takes to be able to remove an ineffective teacher from their job, in some places, it's almost a higher standard than a criminal standard, right? And so I think that is, is one of the most harmful dynamics that we can have. The standard for having a job as a teacher cannot be do no harm. That's a low bar, right? We have to have the mentality, not that you're just not doing any harm to kids, but because that mentality assumes that it is a right an expectation that you, can, that you have a job as a teacher. It is not a right, it is a privilege to teach our children. And in order to have that privilege, you have to be able to proactively show that you can move student achievement levels aggressively. And, and shifting from one mindset to another, I think is gonna be the, the, the most difficult challenge that we face with our union partners. Consul student Patrick, there we go. Hello, thank you for being here today. My name is uh, Patrick Banks and I'm a student here at the Clinton School. Um, I want to start off by saying that I'm a 2006 Teach for America Corps member. Right. So the reality that you described in D.C. is the same reality that I saw going on in St. Louis, which is my hometown and where I taught. Um, last year I got the opportunity to visit uh, Jeffrey Canada in Harlem. Um, and I really feel that he's doing a great job in redefining the way we prioritize education. Um, but his approach is um, to look more holistically when we talk about accountability, to not only hold teachers and schools accountable, but also look at the community. And I guess I was wondering, how are you uh, stepping outside of that, that traditional framework of a chancellor to, to hold parents and the community of a child accountable uh, the way you do with the teachers? So I believe that accountability at some point has to, has to sit in multiple places. You can't just hold just teachers or just principals or just the chancellor accountable. Um, eventually you have to hold teach, uh, uh, parents accountable, students accountable, community accountable, et cetera. However, I think we have a dynamic in Washington, D.C. today 
where we're not at the place where we can start making demands on our parents, and let me tell you why. A, a whole lot of the parents of the, of the school-aged kids in Washington, D.C., themselves are products of the public school system, and they were done a disservice throughout their education. So they're very wary of the school system, number one, because they weren't given a quality education. Two, if you would see how parents are treated in most of our schools, it is absolutely abominable what happens. People walk, I mean, to a school, school staff will be on the phone, chatting it up, getting their coffee, this sort of thing. They're totally ignoring the parent there. Or when they finally put down the phone to deal with them, they act like they're doing them a favor by talking to them. That is not okay. We need to understand very clearly that children first and foremost, and then their parents and families, are our customers, are our constituents. We have to have a completely different mentality when it comes to actually serving those people because that is our job. And until I feel like we are doing a better job across the system of making sure that parents feel welcomed, that we're creating an environment where they feel like they can be engaged productively in their child's uh, uh, education, that, they, that we are giving them very clear ways about how to participate in those, in those positive and productive ways, then I don't think that we can hold them accountable for anything because we've got to clean our house up first. Ready? Thank you. First, I want to um, I want to thank you for being here and for the courage you have to change a system which is very difficult to change. But I didn't hear you mention ESL students, and I wanted to know if. If, what is the number of ESL students in your district and what you do to include them in the education system? Uh, uh, this uh, question just came up with the student group and what I told them is that I don't have any silver bullet solutions when it comes to ESL students. The, the sad reality is that when we came in to uh, office, our biggest problem with our ESL population was that we weren't actually in compliance with basic laws around the services and the resources that we were providing to our ESL, that's English as a second language, learners. And so all we spent our first two years doing was making sure we came into compliance and that we were providing the base level of necessary services and the correct amount of resources to those kids. And the outcome has been fascinating because based on the last year's DC CAST test, which is our high stakes test, um, the ESL students at the elementary level are now outperforming the district average, which is very unusual for an urban center like ours. I will say though that, um, and I relayed the story as well, I met um, a, a few months ago with a group of ESL high school students because they had requested a meeting with me. I never turned down ever a meeting with a student so this group of about 30, 40 kids come into my conference room. They're stacked you know, all around. And they were talking to me about everything that they're not getting, why they don't feel like they're getting a quality education, what some of the problems are uh, in their schools. And they were from school, high schools from across the city. And I remember one of the young women who said to me, she said, you know, I think what a lot of the adults in our school don't understand is because we're English language learners and this is our second language, we just need more help. She said, so do you think it would be possible for us to get extra work outside of school that we could work on, not during class time, and that maybe if somebody could grade that work and tell us what we had done wrong, and then we could see and we could learn from that, and then we really feel like we'd be um, able to catch up very quickly. And then if we could take a book home too, that would be even better. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, this child me is begging me for homework, right? Uh, asking me as if it would be some huge privilege for her to have the extra work every day that got graded, God forbid. Uh, and so that's just the reality that our, a lot of our kids face in, in, in our high schools um, is that a lot of them don't receive homework every day. They don't, we don't provide for them the, leg, the level of rigor that they need to be able to quickly accelerate their learning. And the kids who come into this country at the secondary levels are the ones who have the hardest time catching up and the ones that we're losing at the fastest rates in terms of the dropout rates, et cetera. We have time for one more in the blue. Our question. Hold what, on, Aaron. What change in terms of uh, stru structurally, like the hours, 
that schools have now and also in the summer, any changes that you would make? And what's also the role of administration? Seems like there's a lot of middle management in the administration around the country. What changes need, what, what's the role of that? Um, I'd say in terms of structural changes, I mean, I'm all for a longer school day and a longer school year. We haven't done that formally, but I've sort of done that informally by creating uh, before and after school programs in every single one of our schools, a really rigorous Saturday academy, um, summer schools, uh, and that sort of thing. So I think de facto we're actually heading in that direction. And the bottom line is that for our kids, because they're so far behind where they need to be, you can't make up for that within the confines of the traditional school day and school year. You have to spend more time doing that. Um, in terms of our administrators, I think what I would say I've, I have really encouraged our administrators to do is think about things differently. Our administrators from uh, instructional superintendents to sort of the mid-level HR and other central office people to even our principals, it's a very compliance-driven culture, right? Check the boxes, move the form over, and what people don't lose sight of in that is the fact that every single decision that they're making is impacting kids in one way or another. And when you, when you start to follow rules for rules' sake, that's where the problems come into play. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end on one story. This is another story about a group of kids, so I always like to, to, to end on kids. Uh, I got another, um, I got, I, I had another meeting with kids, and this time it was because a young man emailed me and he said, um, I would like to schedule a meeting with you ASAP. I said, okay. So I forwarded it onto my scheduler, and I kind of forgot about it. And a few weeks later, at the end of a very hard day, I walk into the room, and there are 10 13-year-old boys sitting around my conference table. They are all wearing suits and ties. They all have manila folders in front of them, and they are looking ridiculously serious. <laughs> so I walk in, and I'm a little sort of caught off guard. So I sit down, and I say, so boys, what can I do for you? And they said, we are here to lobby you to allow us to stay in our school next year. So these were 10, 13-year-old boys. They're all in the eighth grade. They are in a middle school that goes up to eighth grade. And they were saying that they wanted to, to stay and keep the ninth grade in their school. It's a fascinating story because the school the year before were part of the closure and consolidation process. So I had closed two failing middle schools and I had consolidated them into one school, which is, you know, never an easy feat. Um, but I hired a great principal. I stole him from Montgomery County, which is one of the suburbs. I let him reconstitute the school so he could hire, you know, brand new staff of people. Um, some veterans, some new, just a great mix of people. And I started hearing things very early on in the school year that good things were happening there. But it was fascinating to hear these kids. So, you know, they're saying, so we, we want you to let us stay. So I'm looking at them. and I don't know if any of you know middle schoolers, but I've never met a middle schooler who wanted to stay in middle school before, right? So I'm looking at this kid and I'm thinking, I throw everything I got at him. I'm like, you know what? If I let you do that, you would not be able to play high school sports. All the boys are like, we're good. I mean, everything I threw at them, they said, I'm okay with that. And finally, after about 45 minutes, I said to them, just, you know, tell me in a nutshell, bottom line, what What's the bottom line? Why do you think you're going to be better off if you stay in this school than if you go off into one of our high schools? And the kid who emailed me said, you want the bottom line? I will bottom line you. He said, in the eight years that I have been in this school district, this is the first year that I feel like I'm getting a high quality education. This man, the principal, cares about us. These people, these teachers care about us. They're doing a fantastic job. They have us all thinking that we're going to go to college now, but they're also honest with us. And they've told us that we're far behind where we need to be. So we're trying to make up for that. He said, but after just a year of this, if we went off to high school, we just feel like there's a high likelihood that we're going to fall into our old ways and get into bad habits and go with the wrong crowd. He said, if we had two years, of this kind of a solid foundation with these people, we'd be okay. I said, so, okay, you're not going to be here next year lobbying me to keep the 10th grade in the middle school. And he said, no, 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 we promise. <coughs> so I leave here, and I go, and I talk to my instructional cabinet, and I said, this is amazing, these kids telling me they love waking up in the morning and coming to school, and I said, they want to stay in the ninth grade, and I could see my staff, they're all like, oh, Lord, here she goes again. So they lay out for me the 50 reasons why. 
We cannot allow this to happen. This, it breaks this rule. We don't have this capacity. This would be messed up. That would be messed up. So I was a little deflated from that, and I went along my way. Two weeks later, someone, one of my staff members comes up to me and says, you have to make a decision, Chancellor, about whether you're going to let those kids stay or not because we're developing the school-based budget and all this sort of thing. And I'm torn. I'm listening to my staff on the one hand, the kids on the other hand. So I decided to go to the school. Now, if any of you have ever been in an urban middle school before, these places are crazy. I mean, you walk in, and it's just, it's just hormones bouncing off the wall everywhere you go. So I walk into this particular school, and it is orderly, and kids are walking around purposeful and focused. It was amazing. Everywhere I go, these kids are just doing what they're supposed to do. And mind you, this, pla these pla this place was out of control last year. And I finally, I'm walking in classroom after classroom. I walk into one classroom. I sit over in the corner. And I'm watching this teacher teach a solid lesson. And all of a sudden, in the other corner, I see this group of little boys, and they're whispering, and they're handing something under the table to each other. And I was like, now that's more like what I expected to see. I'm going to go bust those kids. So I stand up, and I walk across the room. I'm like, I don't know what they're handing to each other. You know, worst case scenario, it's like a joint. Best case scenario, it's an iPod or something. I walk over there. One of the children has cut an article out of the Washington Post and highlighted with a yellow highlighter his favorite parts of the article, and he's passing it around to the other kids, and they're all reading it and talking about it. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Even when the kids are doing something they're not supposed to be doing, it's actually not that bad. I left that building. I went back to that central office. I said, we are going to let those kids stay at that school. And, I, and you know, my staff was oh, OK. And, and this is what I said, though. I said, once we become the kind of bureaucrats who are making decisions because it's what the system, what's good for the system, instead of what's good for these kids. Because I couldn't look these kids in the eye and say, I've got a place for all of you at a great high school where you're going to get the same kind of education that you're getting here. I couldn't do that. I said, so we need to become the kind of people who are willing to break whatever rules we need to break, and we need to look beyond the way that the system has traditionally done something if it is what is right and good for kids. And so that is what I try to get my administrators to always be thinking about in the back of their mind as you make every single decision what is in the best interest of kids. Thank you.